Uh, everyone kindly take their seats. We'll get started. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to the main library here in Hong Kong U. I am Gary Chin, the Public Relations and Development Manager for the libraries. And we're very excited to have Mr. Tam, James Tam, here to present his book, uh, Man's Last Song. And at, at the end of the uh, session, there will be, um, after his talk, there will be a Q&A session. And then finally, I'll close with some information on our upcoming book talks and events. Okay. And now I'll pass the microphone over to Gillian Bickley, who, who is our evening's moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. It's delightful to see so many people, many friends of James, and hopefully people who will be new friends and readers of his book. Um, it's not my job to talk about the book, but to talk about James. And those people who just come in, there's two seats in the front. There are two seats in the front. You could move my... Sorry, Gary, I didn't mean to move Thank you very much. Um, so I know James through the Hong Kong Writers Circle, and also because I'm his publisher. I'm going to read what, uh, what it says in the book. So if you want to review James Bio, buy the book, read, read the book, and read the bio. So James was born in Hong Kong. He lived and studied in Canada in the 70s. That doesn't date him very much. <laughs> and returned to Hong Kong in the 80s to work as an environmental engineer. He started his own environmental engineering practice and additionally a software company. The software company won the premier IT Excellence Award and the Hong Kong Industry Award in 1996. In 2008, James tells us, he realized his long-term plan to leave business before too late. He doesn't tell us too late for what, but before too late. And sat down to write. Maybe before it was too late to sit down and write. He now writes fiction and non-fiction, sometimes in English, sometimes in Chinese. His short stories and occasional poems have received honorary mentions in competitions and appeared in anthologies. His novel, Man's Last Song, is his first full-length novel. It was a finalist for the International Progress Prize in 2011 and it won a supplementary award. Now, this is his little confession at the end. He says, as a scientific realist, often mistaken for a morbid cynic, surely not, he sees abundant evidence that 21st century homo sapiens is a delusional and self-endangered species. I guess we all agree with the last part, but maybe not, maybe not the delusional part. Nevertheless, he says he remains irrationally optimistic with a lovely family. You see his wife and one of his daughters here this evening. So I'm, I'm sure we agree with him that he does have a lovely family. So now I'm going to let James take over and tell us whatever he wants to tell us about his book. I hope you'll be thinking about difficult questions to ask him afterwards. Can you catch him out on his logic or his conclusions? I'm sure he'll be very capable of answering. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, Julian. Before too late, it's always relative. You know, some some people thought I retired too early from productive work, and uh, I always think 
it's well, well, whether I retire earlier or not depends on when I die, right? Yeah. If I if I die tomorrow, I retire very late. <laughs> but if I die, live a long life, then yes, I retire early, and I so far I'm not regretting. Um, and uh, I have to thank the library, thanks Gary for the excellent arrangement. It's it's really uh, professional, and uh, I'm very happy to be here to give a talk about uh, my book. Maybe not quite a book, but a background of uh, how the book came about, and uh, and therefore bring on some of my uh, irrelevant opinions. I have a lot of them. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah. Too well. Too well. <laughs> Because of that, you know, I find it always a bit, uh, you know, uh, difficult to give a talk at university because you don't know who's in the audience. You know, I know a number of friends, but there's, there's, there's a possibility of, you know, an expert here who really knows something I pretend to know is very high. That's why I, I take the unusual step of uh, uh, first giving a disclaimer. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't had a TV at home since 1982. And uh, I do not normally read the newspaper. I very, I, in fact, I very rarely read the newspaper. So I, um, I'm very out of touch with mainstream opinion, uh, which is part of the reason why I remain, as, as Julian introduced, irrationally optimistic. Uh, but uh, the thing is, uh, according to my non-mainstream impression, uh, so well, whatever. So. Uh, Whenever people accuse me of, I don't know what I'm talking about, I have to say they're right. They're always right. But the thing is, they don't, they don't know. They, are all, they also don't know what they're talking about. That, that is the problem. Uh, because according to my non-mainstream uh, impression, uh, the world is becoming dangerously, maybe irresponsible is not the right <coughs> word, but it's a PowerPoint, you know. Uh, it's, uh, the, the world is it's very disoriented in my in my. Uh, but without many people noticing. I was going to say in my view, but I don't think it's my view. I think a lot of us agree with that, you know. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's, my, that's my disclaimer. Uh, but there is one, well, when I say the world has become quite uh, dangerously disoriented or irresponsible, I think there is one strange consensus. This is a consensus from my observation among people of different, from different nationalities, from different cultural background, you know, for, uh, for religious affiliation. Everyone that seems to agree on one thing is that there's something wrong with the way things are going. Uh, and I, I think there's very few uh, objection to that. But what is it, you know, and as a result we just, we talk about it, everyone talks about it. There's a lot of discussion that, about that. Uh, although I definitely know nothing about anthropology, but I do wonder, did Homo sapiens talk ourselves to the top of the food chain? Uh, if not, we're certainly doing a lot of talking at the top of the food chain, and hopefully we'll, it, it would help us to stay there. But it's okay to just talk, just have problems and, and, and discuss problems. That's part of human nature, I suppose. However, the, the problems we face now, uh, a, lo a lot of them will eventually affect the, the planet, uh, or more specifically, uh, uh, affect the suitability of this planet for human habitation at current population and rate of consumption. Uh, I think that's just, just mathematics. And also, also perspective. It reminds me of a talk I gave in the, on this prestigious campus uh, some years ago. I think at the time I was the I was the chairman of the Hong Kong Institution of Engineers Environmental Division. Uh, therefore, the honor. And I, I came to talk. Um, I think the students were expected, you know, everyday environmentalists. It was a technical tree hugging talk. But <laughs> I I came here. The first thing I noticed was a very cute poster. A poster of uh, of the Earth, a globe, a globe somehow with little little arms growing, you know, like a, uh, from the equator, and, and rubbing eyes growing roughly at the position of the United States. I think that's an, <laughs> an unintentional good touch. <laughs> but 
but there was the, the earth is crying, and then there's a very large size font at the bottom which says, uh, uh, "Save me," you know, the earth is crying, save me. So I, when I gave a talk, I, I my opening remark was quite uh, realistic, but but realism back then already uh, was labeled uh, cynicism. So I was being quite cynical also at the same time. And I just said, uh, uh, I said, the Mother Earth, listen, our Mother Earth is not more than just being asexual. Our Mother Earth also doesn't care. Mother Earth doesn't care whether uh, or any, any humans left on this planet tomorrow. If every single one of us die, the Earth would be not happier or not unhappier. I think you would see later than that. In fact, in some aspects, a lot of things will become happier. Uh, but in any event, it would continue to spin around itself and the sun doing its cosmic ballet. It, uh, so I said, what we need to see is that it's not the Earth we're trying to save, it's us, it's us, it's our own habitation. Uh, that, uh, I think. I think a few people got that. So that's the point. When that happened, will we be missed? You know, that's the theme of the book. There's no more people. When there's no more people, will we, will we be missed? And as uh, you, there will be some description in the book, uh, in the absence of humans, the planet makes a happy comeback. The sky is blue, full of stars. Uh, in the moonless night, you can see the bottom of Victoria Harbour. There will be, there will be dolphins diving through Victoria Harbour. You will believe it or not, and free of charge. You don't have to pay any glass bottom boats and stuff like that. And be teeming with fish. And uh, so, I don't think I don't think anyone will miss us. Not even us, because we won't be here, right? That's it. But the, but the interesting thing is that it's not like that we don't know our, our, our position, where we are in the big picture. You know, we, have, we are not very knowledgeable. In fact, I'm quite, I'm, I, have, I have great confidence in how little we know in the big picture. But relatively, in our small little world, we, are quite, we have collected a lot of data. We are quite knowledgeable. We are knowledgeable enough to know that we are downright negligible in the grand scale of things. Why? Just, just, let's just look at what we have learned from astronomy. Uh, we are, there are approximately, well, close to one trillion stars by our estimation. And because the other estimation is point, if they talk about infinite universe, infinite parallel universe, there are infinite things out there. And uh, just within Milky Way, Milky Way, there are hundreds of billions of stars in Milky Way. And Milky Way, when you go out further, it's only one dot in the sky. And, and uh, our planet is not particularly large, not even particularly small. It's very mediocre. And we are, and we are one out of another hundreds and hundreds of billions of life forms on this, on this mediocre planet. Although, although, yes, we are on top of things for the moment but we have only appeared quite recently. And uh, we have, in this, in this book, there are lots of, uh, uh, there are from a few, not a lot, but a few reflections <coughs> of the past. And this is, uh, and, and this is one of them, a character called John Johnson. He, he was wondering out loud why the human race is disappearing. <coughs> Out of a thousand living things that ever roamed the planet, 999 are long gone. That's a, that's a fact, that's a, as far as we know. Thoroughly dead. This is a spooky place. Death Valley in the Milky Way. Fine. And mankind has been around for only a little more than one pitiful minute if the age of Earth is put into a 24-hour time scale. He's heard all that before. We're downright negligible, okay? And extinction seems unavoidable, natural, even expected. Certainly what? Certainly not surprising. But wait. He said, wait, because this John Johnson is a tough guy. You know, he used to be a soldier. And he's not giving up uh, easily, so we'll, maybe we'll leave him to 
contemplate for a little while about about uh, position in the big picture. And return a little bit to the problems we mentioned about uh, the humanities facing this moment. I mean, not in the book. It, it baffled me for a while. Why can't we see the existential threats we've uh, created for ourselves? Given the limited knowledge, but enough sufficient knowledge that we have. Why, you know, I mean, isn't, isn't, survival, isn't survival kind of important? Survival is a very strong animal instinct. And all these things is uh, uh, affecting our very survival. And we seem to be very blind to it, which kind of, you know, you think about it, it's kind of baffling because it's our animal nature to, to, to react to it, but we don't, you know. Maybe because we're confused while in the situation with some hindsight help, because a lot of wise people have said that hindsight uh, is a 2020 vision. So I said, uh, well, if, if hindsight help, you know, let there be hindsight. And there was hindsight. And uh, from, I created an imagined future, and from an imagined future, I see a few main uh, uh, issues, a few main causes of the current problems. <coughs> me. Number one is overpopulation. Number two is excessive consumerism and disproportionate environmental degradation. Dysfunctional politics. Someone's laughing. And, uh, and also, uh, human relationships uh, don't seem to be able to catch up with abrupt lifestyle changes and uh, incessant uh, distractions. You see that uh, I have uh, italicized some of the uh, quantifiers over here uh, for a reason. It's not just for style. It kind of looks good too. But <laughs> and incessant should be in italic as well. Because you look at it, <clears throat> all, these, all these words by itself, it's not a problem. A population, of course, is not a problem. With, without population, well, I mean, you know, when there's life, there's population. And there's nothing wrong with population uh, because without it, we cannot e we're not even qualified to cause problems. And when, when there's life, when there's population, we will consume, we'll consume something. You know, even even eating rice, that's a kind of consumption. We we are here to consume, like all the other animals on the planet. And of course we are, but we are at the top of the uh, pyramid, so it's only right that we have also, we are quite clever, we are cl a lot more clever than our monkeys uh, and, and monkey ancestors. So we, uh, will, we will be manufacturing, we'll be doing something. And I don't see anything wrong with it. And, and at least it's, it's inevitable, right? <clears throat> and when we do that, there will be environmental footprints. Everyone leaves environmental footprint. Of course we do. You know, even a goldfish leaves environmental footprint, although they don't have feet. But <laughs> fin print, fin print. <laughs> so that's nothing wrong with that also. And politics. Well, uh, politics has become a very negative term all over the world. Uh, I, that it shouldn't be because don't forget, uh, human beings got to this, got to the comfortable top of the food chain, because we know how to organize leadership, and and the, the smart guys take us into situations, take us ahead, take risk, and so on. And so, what's wrong with politics? And that's part of politics. And through that, there will be, of course, there will be power struggle, difference in opinion. This is all very human for thousands for thousands of years. And then uh, life always changes. They, uh, you know, there is no permanence. We all know that. We don't have to be a Buddhist to see that life changes all the time. Uh, you, you cannot depend on anything. But the problem are all the yellow uh, italics, you know, overpopulation. When there are way too many of us, and when consumerism, you see that consumerism, the way we are consuming, is almost for no reason. We are not benefiting ourselves. Uh, and then uh, environmental degradation becomes, as a result, disproportionate. Uh, uh, we are doing a lot of things that is that don't have to be this way. 
and politics that becomes dysfunctional. I'll go into all this a little, in a little bit. And of course, uh, we lifestyle can change. It has been evolving. Or it's always evolving. You cannot stop it. But but uh, you also see that this has been very abrupt, and we don't seem to be able to handle it. And the, the distractions we create for ourselves seems to be much worse than opium. We are constantly uh, checking my, my, our iPhone. Oh, where's my phone, by the way? <laughs> you got my phone. Uh, we were constantly checking it, you know? You know it's, uh, it's people were just checking the phone, we're texting while giving a, giving a talk. And I'm, I'm very happy. No one is texting right now. Something is wrong. I, the last few talks I, I gave, in fact, uh, long, I, I used to give, a, sometimes give a talk to the environmental graduates at the graduating class in, in at this university. They were very, I, I least started out to be very impressive. Good questions. You know, it, we have to, to start, like the, 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 the best uh, young men in Hong Kong come to this, came to this university. Uh, I should have corrected my grammar. Sorry, but, uh, uh, but then, but then the last one I gave seriously. Only three persons sat in the front were listening to me, and the rest were running around. They were exchanging, they were texting each other, and then showing each other the hard copy of the text. Um, so uh, it it's gone. I think that one. Uh, I think it was Master Nan Nan Hai Jing. I read one of his book. He said that the, uh, 19th, the 20th century disease would be cancer. He said the 21st century disease uh, that plague humanity will be mental disease. I think he's right. It's not a crazy idea. And because all these issues are interrelated. They are the causes as well as uh, co uh, consequence of each other. Uh, uh, I think it, it should be quite obvious. I mean, for example, progress increases life expectancy, therefore it boosts the population. You know, don't forget in, the, in for example, in 19, 1949 when, uh, when China made the, made the new changes, the, that life expectancy was 35, and now it's, it's in its uh, late 70s, maybe. Um, for women, women always live longer for some reason. I never figured that out. <laughs> you know, maybe talking helps. And more, more resources are needed to satisfy the, uh, you know, the expanded middle class, which, uh, which wants and not needs. That that is a very, uh, the the most uh, the point, the, the important point, is that a lot of time we 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 don't need things. We just want. Uh, it reminds me of a. Of a saying of one of my Canadian friends, he uh, told me, gave me a good description of the of the southern neighbors. I don't think that's fair. I think it applies to all of us. All of us have become that way. Is that that we have become people who buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. <laughs> you know, but but that's uh, that is the situation. So, but because of this want. Wanting things we don't need, we are we are causing. We've forgotten that there's a huge environmental uh, cost to that. And uh, result, yeah, resource uh, resource demands results in environmental pressure. But uh, but consumption cannot. then, well, we say, what about consumption slowing down? But it cannot slow down because as a population increase, you need we need. The consumption to catch up actually, because otherwise, if you don't have the activities to catch up, a lot of people will be doing nothing. And when people are doing nothing, so far we haven't figured out a way to deal with it. It's not a matter of just economic uh, communism or something. It just doesn't work. It's not human nature. And when people uh, have nothing to do, they would cause trouble to themselves and others. So activities are uh, created for the sake of activities to keep the economy going, to keep uh, uh, our present model. Uh, going and that's another <clears throat> a small paragraph I uh, taken from the book you know it's and what's worse is that you'll see that rich nations were fatally dependent on suicidal growth and consumption poor nations strove to become the same uh, 
there was no turning back. Humans were being chased down the cliff by the hungry tigers they had raised. Keep running and jump, or stop and be eaten. One character, I, I, actually, is not so serious. I know it sounds so serious now. You know, I notice people starting to, you know, look very depressed. It's not <laughs> I, the, the way I present all this, I, I do have a lot of questions, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't have the answer. I can't even pretend I have the answer. And, and, I, and through two diametrically opposed characters, one is the diehard workaholic, you can call him a, 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 a multi, multi-corporation loyalist and a capitalist, and the other guy is a, it's a very highly intelligent dropout. You know, and he he worked in the, the civil service and figured figure out how to recite and recycle his files so that he can work on the same thing year after year without damaging the environment. You know, I never did that. I'm not, I, I never worked for the civil service. And so uh, this guy described this situation as a whole digging economy. He said, you think about the economy. What is the economy that we put so much, uh, we take so much pride in? Imagine if I were, you know, I dig a hole in the ground. I'm crazy. I'm hyper. I dig a big hole in the ground, and this gentleman <laughs> standing <laughs> decide to fill it back up, you know. And then I say, why did you fill up my hole? So I dig the hole again, and they fill it up again. And then so I hire more people because I've got some money. Some venture capitalist is behind me. I I hire I hire a lot of people to fill it up faster. You hire a lot of uh, to, to dig it out faster, you hire a lot of people to fill it up faster. I start to invent, talk to the manufacturers, they do research, invent machines to dig the hole fast and deep, and then you invent machines to dig the hole fast and deep. Now we're creating a lot of activities in the factory, there's researchers, there's engineers, and they're doing all these things. And, uh, and uh, you know, engineers, of course, they, they go home, they think they have a very meaningful job, right? And then they go home, they're stressed, they have bad breath, but then they say, well, but I've got a job to do. I gotta, you don't know, I've got I've to come up with this new design for a hole digging machine within two weeks, or the, otherwise my boss would find me. Oh, sorry, darling, yeah, go ahead, think about it. And, uh, and, and all these are happening, and then don't forget, behind them, they, you need support, you know, so you need accountant, you need a controller, you, you even need HR manager, believe it or not. And, and all these happen, and then when they go to work, they need, to, they have, they need uh, commuting, they, have to, they need daycare for the kids, and so on. You think about it, a very vi vibrant economy can actually uh, develop from a hole in the ground, which is only a part-time hole in the ground. <laughs> the, the analogy might, might be absurd, but the principle is not, to me anyway. But I'm absurd. And, and another issue is waste, wastefulness. I, I'm, not, I'm not a tree hugger. I, I enjoy my luxuries and so on. I, 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 you know, I take uh, plane rides. Uh, but a lot of what we do is uh, wasteful. And, and what's worse, it, it's, it's uh, encouraged systemically. They would never, nobody would ever admit that they encourage wastefulness. Everyone is very environmentally conscious, but in fact there are many examples. Over specifications, for example, you know, a ridiculously conservative uh, uh, estimate of expiry, li uh, expiry life, of food, of medicine, of everything. You know what? Uh, eye drops, when I was a kid, I buy eye drops, I use it for years, you know? <laughs> My eyes is not very good. Maybe it's partly due to that. I use it for years. Now you look at it. It said once it's open for a month, I have to throw it away. I've only used two drops, and I have to throw it away. You know, but this is all done by marketing managers and marketing. You know, and uh, I'm just using two very petty examples. But there are lots of examples of this kind of wastefulness. I used to say, if we can somehow deal with this uh, systemic wastefulness, we can solve maybe 30, maybe even 50% of our environmental problem without changing our lifestyles. Then it, it brings me to think about traditional work ethics. Uh, it, you know, 
we, I, especially us in Hong Kong, you know, Chinese, we brought up the most, uh, the most, the, the highest virtue, uh, according to my father, is to respect him, of course. Yes. You know, and number two is to work hard. And uh, we, we, we all, I, I have no problem with working hard, and I have worked very hard for a couple of decades. It aged me tremendously. <laughs> but, and, and I think that uh, there is nothing wrong with working hard, but if we, if we are working hard to make a living, it's very admirable and necessary. But a lot of what we're working seems to be uh, counterproductive with no beneficiaries. That, that's my, my point again, you know. And when, when in the corporate world I, I was, I never uh, stopped being amazed by a lot, of the, a lot of the work that we do is completely pointless. I, do, I really do mean pointless, including documents that stamp very important and confidential. <laughs> and normally I just leave it sit there for a couple of days and then I look at it and number one, I know from experience it's not very important. And there's no point being confidential because it just makes the person feel good when I tell you something. Yeah. It's listen, confidential. You know, and there's nothing. But, but, but we have so much of that work in the, in the modern world. You know, a little bit of that is cute. But I, I, again, it's a matter of proportion. I, I do think uh, we've overdone. And when uh, you know, and don't forget, if I may remind you again, all these, all these have an environmental cost, which very easily we overlook. We're only doing it in the beginning, just ah, you know, just for fun. I create work, so we keep each other employed. There's nothing, there's no harm in it. But all these extra activities have an environmental cost. Uh, and being a pseudo technician, I but another thing I see is, that's why it bring bring me to the to seeing the next issue, is that, uh, that but a lot of the problems we face now actually have solutions. They do have technical solutions. They may not be perfect, but uh, it's not like that. We look at it and just be uh, helplessly and say, oh, there's nothing we can do. Most of them, there's a lot we can do. Even global warming, we've known global warming for decades and, and no one can do anything. Now finally they say they're going to do something. Whether it's true or not, we have to wait and see. But, but according to m most experts' opinion, it's already too late, but it's better than nothing. But why do we have to wait so long? I think that, yeah, if I can sum it up, is it seems that uh, when, when planetary affairs becomes more complex, prodigiously complex because of the, the reason I just talked about we're creating so a, a multitude of activities that that uh, a lot of them are not necessary, necessarily rational because the, uh, a situation is so complex it requires long-term vision and long-term vision naturally requires consistent adjustment because we cannot see what we should do in the next 50 years and be right Obviously, it would, uh, it would be only a rough framework with lots of uh, uncertainties that require trial and error. So we need consistent adjustments and uh, difficult trade-offs. You know. But at the same time, politics have become very short-term and uh, demagogic, uh, very populist. Uh, so you can see politics, we have to rely on politics. We, that's the only institution we have to solve human problems. And human problems have become very complex and long-term, yet politics become very short-term and populist. So the problem persists. That's why in the beginning I say when we have these problems, we just talk and talk and talk. Because why? So far we can still afford it, and talking about it makes us feel good. I talk about the problem, right? You know, I care. And what do you do about it? Well, mm, I don't know, up to the government, up to the, if he's, what, what if he's no good? Then you elect another one. And he's worse. <laughs> now that's the terrifying picture I see from the future. You might have forgotten. All this is because I've created uh, fictional hindsight and I look back and I saw all this. And, and it's terrifying, it's depressing. I'm really sorry, but I can't lie, it's a fact. However, there's always hope in story then. That's what I learned when I was a kid. So uh, thought, well, that's why I started to write, fi write fiction. 
In fact, uh, when I re when I retired, I wanted to write a book, but I I learned I wanted to write uh, uh, an easy to understand uh, the de uh, tech design textbook on wastewater treatment. Can you imagine? <laughs> Uh, but then, uh, then after all this, I decided to write a, uh, uh, write fiction, and uh, then and then I asked myself, I've never written fiction before. But I said, well, I've written a lot of board papers before, so I know I know how to lie in a convincing <laughs> way and be creative with my writing. So here I go. <laughs> the first thing I find out actually when I created in hindsight also is hindsight. Uh, depends on situation, not just time. Uh, if if a situation hasn't changed, you can go a thousand years into the future, you would not develop that 2020 vision. But if the situation situation has changed, even though uh, you don't go very far into the future, you, you do develop this hindsight. <coughs> and that's the the novel, Man's Last Song. Believe it or not, I always I always come up with the title of my stories before I start writing. I don't know why, I still do. And uh, that's, that's a very lonely person, that's man's last song. He, he's, he's actually, his hands are in his pocket. He's not, uh, he's not being unhygienic. But, if, but even if he is, it doesn't matter anymore. Because there are no, no, no people around uh, uh, to demand his courtesy. In the year 2090, that basically, after decades of universal sterility, the human race is dying out. The youngest man alive, his name is Song Sang, uh, Hong Kong Eurasian. Uh, he's, uh, he's already 40 years old, he's the youngest man alive. That basically is the, the background setting of the story. Terrible, isn't it? <coughs> that might sound a bit far-fetched, uh, but if you uh, think about it, uh, s statistically, well, I also take this uh, little paragraph from the book. Statistically, human existence is, is a miracle. It is a miracle, you know. Uh, but once existence has happened, the eventual extinction is certain. If not because of this, it be because of that. It's only a matter of time. Uh, and, and unless you take a, a more conventional religious view, that's just a statement, and and, and it's uh, you, we can. There's nothing we can do about it. And as one of the another character speculates the reason for universal sterility, and uh, I will offer that. It's, like I say, it's only it's only a speculation, um, and it says, well, the atmosphere is a thin crust of the planet. Proportionally like the skin of an apple. Uh, our planet is what, uh, 10,000 kilometers in diameter, roughly. Uh, our atmosphere is only a few kilometers. <coughs> Something that humans had been jamming into it for decades, perhaps, perhaps centuries, suspecting no, suspecting no harm, accumulated quietly. Parts per trillion became, became parts per billion, Parts per billion became parts per million. Obviously, breath by breath, our mysterious, and it is very mysterious, and fragile reproductive systems were nibbled at, eaten alive by our own waste. One day, it snapped. You know, I, to me, it's not that far-fetched. And uh, there is a lot, we think that we know a lot, there is, it, it's only an impression. We know very little, even about our own planet. Not to say the existence, existence of life, not to say the far end of the universe, what is parallel uni universe, what is, what is infinity. We know nothing about those. We also know very little about our, our planet. We, have, we just think we do. For, I'll give you an example. I just said our diameter is 10,000 kilometers. What's the deepest hole we've drilled uh, we can reach artificially? I think it's about one kilometer. I'm not sure, you have to Google, don't trust it. But, you know, I'll make it double, two kilometers, in that order of magnitude. This is how far we can penetrate. We don't even know what's in the, uh, uh, in the center of this planet. You know, we, everything is a speculation. But we make it so convincing, just like board paper, just like novel, 
most people believe it, believe it, and then we have high confidence. Anyway, so that that's the that's the background. That's how the setting came about, and uh, of course I. I I'm an engineer by my background is in engineering. I, there's one thing when I read books, I, I'm always very critical. Come on, that's not possible. Come on, that doesn't make sense. You know, the numbers don't add up. So when I do it myself, I actually had did that. I've done quite a bit of research, and I actually do my own numerical simulation, and uh, I, I show. And all, I, all these are not in the book, so you haven't bought all these. That would be extremely boring. <laughs> no. Uh, but I, it is my background. I have to satisfy myself that that this is uh, what uh, it's, it's possible. And this one, uh, interesting, is the enough is the average age. You would see that it's the average age would well. There's no more baby in the beginning of the graph on the left hand side, right? And then average age would go up, obviously, because there's no more babies, no more young people. The average age of this planet would climb steadily. And there's no more babies. Why would the average age come down? You know, so there are a few events in here. For example, the one, the most important one, being at some point, at some point, we cannot afford to generate electricity anymore. And you think about it: if there's no more electricity on this planet, our life expectancy would plunge immediately. There's no more arti life artificially suspended by electrons. And that's the overall population. Uh, and here you would see something that most uh, end of the world scenario do not expect. And I was slightly surprised. Uh, I started with 7 billion people, which actually, by the way, 7 billion people is what we have today. Uh, I, I, I want to do a last minute check. So, you know, just in case there's a population expert in the audience. Uh, Close to it. I, I, I checked that. Yeah. Uh, that's a few hours ago. A few hours ago, according to current world population, it's already 7.4 billion. Uh, increasing, increasing at 20 million every year. And that's a few hours ago. More now, I know. But I know. And uh, first talk about this graph is that why, okay, and then the plunges happen. I, I find out that if I just leave it, everything as it is. Number one, I came up with the conclusion, the inevitable conclusion. In such a scenario, no more babies. That would be to the disappointment of, uh, of uh, uh, movie makers and uh, Ashetologists, they're called ashetologists. Can you imagine they have a word for people who specialize in the end of the world? Huh? But they, uh, to their disappointment, there will be no drama. There's no dragon fights in the sky, no Armageddon, Armageddon and all that stuff. It, it would just be a slow, drawn out death in that case. And the world would go on for a long time, in, I, I, my, in my conclusion, doing what we're doing now. Because why? Because with such a large population, and there will be less and less incentive, almost no incentive to start wars under that situation because there's no new generation. And the only way for everyone to survive is to do whatever we've been doing. And, pro and we will postpone retirement to, uh, I don't know, the late 70s or whatever. And we continue to do what we're doing. We all have food, we all, the supermarkets still open, electricity is still running the machines and so on. There's no other option. So, but when I find out that scenario, I was shocked because you can imagine how boring the story is going to be. You know, just things as usual for the next 40 years and then they die off. But I found out that actually no. At some point, number one, there will be, uh, there will be popular, uh, popular, yeah, well, there will be the reasons that we are becoming more and more concerned with, such as uh, epidemics. That's a big thing. Just think of the last few years. We're all familiar with chicken flu, and then there was uh, pig flu, and then there's Ebola, and before there's, uh, of course, there's AIDS, and now there's one, I don't, I forgot, how to seek it? I forgot, the, yeah, because I've lost interest in them, too many. You know, and, and so they will, under that situation, there will be some batch reduction of, uh, in, popula uh, in population. And also, you see that big plunge is once, electricity is turned off, 
I figure a lot of old people would just die right away, huh? you know, and because oh, very, very soon uh, the, uh, when we lose that artificial capability. So by the time uh, you see that at the very end of the curve, that's where our story, you know, the flat, the plateau at the bottom. And when there's only maybe roughly in Hong Kong, I figure the whole of Hong Kong might have about 2,000 people left and uh, inherit, inherit this is uh, all the infrastructure, and then that's how our, our story a lot of scenes take place. Uh, but when that happened, I call them postmodern savages. These people, imagine if only a few thousand people living in Hong Kong, all the buildings and everything. You can live on the peak for free, you know, the <laughs> real good, real, real, but very few people will live on the peak. That, uh, that's my that's my uh, uh, speculation because it's, uh, it's humid and we're all old people. You don't want to walk up and down the peak, it's inconvenient. So ironically, the real estate price for the peak for, for the first time dropped to something that's affordable to everyone in Hong Kong. So, the, you know, and then no one wants to live there. Uh, and, but they, I call them Stone Age, uh, you know, uh, postmodern savages. But comparing with real, real Stone Age, uh, their ancestors, there are a few differences. Number one, we have knowledge. So it's easier for to survive. We know what's coming, you know, we know what's happening. We know about the typhoons. We know about animals and so on. And we also have secure shelters. Everyone can have a few apartment blocks to themselves. In fact, one of the characters re, re, uh, was raising chicken in one of the most expensive penthouses in, in mid-level. You know, just, just to, just, an, as, I, I suppose that's a social statement. Um, and, and also, uh, there's plenty of leftover fine spirits. Uh, that's important because I figured, well, wine might go bad, but uh, things like cognac, you know, and, well, they don't go bad. I and mean, when it's free, and there's a oh, happy hour, 24 hours a day, and there's only a few people around. And so, what, hap what, what happened to men, especially, when there are lots of free drinks? And uh, lots of time, so they just uh, talk and talk and talk, just like what we do. Um, but there's a, there's pros and cons. There's another thing is uh, uh, the our ancestors, Stone Age ancestors, don't think too much. Whereas in this situation, uh, our our children in the future, and there's only so few of them left, they might think too much, and the psychological condition is it would be different. But anyway, when they talk and talk a lot, and they, uh, they, with their fictional hindsight, we do look ridiculous. And that's where some of these questions come out, and they are very serious questions, and, uh, and a, a few of the playful answers are given in the book. Uh, and what, that's why we, they, they look at us as unthinking, and, uh, an unthinking, self-endangered species. That's why I... I like to, it's my, one of my favorite terms when I refer to people, I like to call ourselves homo sapiens. Uh, any Latin experts here, I think it, it means um, kind of a thinking monkey, that kind. But we have stopped thinking, so I think we should change our name. We shouldn't call ourselves thinking mon monkey anymore, because that's inappropriate. Uh, and we are a self-endangered species, while we worry about other, other species are being endangered by us too. I have just I have said about that. And what happened, well, just a few words on their present. What happened to them when they live in this uh, situation? Well, there are many things that can be painful, uh, comical, uh, and maybe com painful and comical at the same time. Uh, for example, losing a dental uh, filling, They're doing it, uh, losing one's dental fillings or spectacles can be disastrous, you know. Imagine when, you know, we live, it's good life, right? You know, you just do a bit of gardening, with chicken, and um, lots of uh, Louis XIV or whatever, because you wouldn't drink anything cheaper. What's the point? They're all free, right? And, uh, but uh, one day, you are just you're eating nothing but something soft like a potato, and your dental filling come off, and it happened to be a big one. Of course, only the big ones fall off. Uh, 
can you imagine how distressed you would be because there's no more dentist around and you know and the tooth is still there, you cannot pull it out and you know there could be just a thin, thin layer between you know, at the bottom of, the, of your tooth you know, connected to a, a nerve and that nerve is also very tiny but it connects right to the brain and, and it will make you scream but when I, one day you, you said it, and then you go, you know, and losing your spectacles is just, it's similar. Once you lose your spectacles to get it made again, it's possible, but very, very difficult. And more sentimentally, what does love mean in the circumstances? You might say, well, love is love. What has love got to do with the circumstances? They are, you know. We, we, a lot of what we do, for example, in the opening chapter of the book, you would find uh, a stranger, you know, our, our our uh, main character run into a stranger is dying uh, on the peak path by the side of the road. He, want, he wants to help him. Of course he wants to help him. When you see, it's our nature, you see someone dying on the road, you want to help him. But then you think about it, there's no way you can take care of this person under the situation. And then, but on the other hand, you know, what we would do now is just to make a phone call, 999, very easy, right? You know, and then you say, oh, this, this guy, on, on uh, dying on the st on, on 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 the road on the street side, can you send an ambulance? Hurry, okay, you know, and uh, someone come, and then you introduce this person to the medics, and then you have to go, right? You got a you got a meeting to go to, and you feel very good. You're late for the meeting, and you say, oh, because there's someone on the road, and I help you. Everyone says, oh, you're such a nice guy, right? And because it's so affordable, everyone can do it, you know. Uh, unless you're already late for the meeting, that's another issue. You know? But in their circumstances, they cannot help and it's very painful. And, and, and another human means a lot more to them than to us. Another human on the, on the street to us is annoying, but to them, another human being on the street is very precious and he's in need of help, yet you have to let him die. Uh, between father and son, a father and son, the, at some point, the father understands that uh, I will, I'm, I'm getting old. All kinds of things can happen. If something happened, my son will be no doubt want to take care of me. But can he? And now I will be so much of a distraction to his life. I'm so, I'll be so much of a burden. What is, what is really, what, what really should I do if I love my son? So that, these are very painful questions. And it, it, it's, uh, but it, it's real to them, you know. And even between men and women, I think I, uh, I have to say that I, I, I think that uh, I've been very biased. I think women will play a much stronger role in a situation like this because women are closer to their instincts, uh, whereas I think men, us men, have lost our instincts uh, much easier in, in this kind of social environment. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, also the natural instinct for women to want the species to continue at all cost is much higher than men. Men never care about these things. Uh, I still don't. You know? So, they, all this and spirituality and comparing with their old their Stone Age ancestors, if something is wrong, they are not feeling happy, they would uh, pray to the rock, pray to the tree and feel much better and pray to God. But uh, our... Postmodern savages uh, have lost all that because they know too much, but that uh, but the situation makes them start wondering again about God, you know, what's Tao, what's nature, and uh, and also why people work so much. And also they have to battle with simple things like mosquitoes. There will be no repellent. The repellent would be truly expire this time, and. Um, and also absolute and irreversible solitude. You know, it, it is something that is very, you, if you imagine it, it, it takes a lot of mental strength to deal with. So, is that the end? I know, I think the time is up, so it has to be the end. And I leave you with the question a lot of people ask me and I'm so tired of answering it. But if you ask this question, I'll answer it again one last time. Is, is that dystopian or utopian? You know, I really think it depends on your perspective. And uh, 
that's my blog. I mean, I try to maintain writing discipline uh, bilingually. I write in English and Chinese on my blog, but uh, but I find that it, it's yeah, it doesn't maintain writing discipline, but it's distracting me from write, uh, working on my next project. Uh, but uh, why why work too much anyway? So, thank you very much. Yes, yes, I, I think that ultimately is the. I think you can hear me without this. Uh, ultimately, it is the is the answer because there is a. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. I'll try it. <laughs> because uh, I think that's the nature of things, you know. Although that's that that is slightly on a you know philosophical <laughs> level. That's why I didn't want to mention it because I might affect book sales. You see. <laughs> you know, and, uh, but actually it is. A anything that comes into being, I did mention it, uh, you know, one uh, uh, existence is um, uh, it itself is a miracle by statistical chance. But once it's happened, it will 100%, 100.1, 100.00, 100.0, percent extinction is inevitable. It will happen. Uh, so uh, maybe it is within our program to let things, to see things reach its peak and then go up and down. However, it, it's, uh, if you look at human history, we do go through a lot of cycles, and that cycles are inevitable. Anyone who think that I can invent some social, social system or whatever, that will last forever. This is a good system, it will last forever. He is either insane or very stupid, you know, so stop talking to him, you know, because it's not possible and it will never happen. You know, whatever good system, eventually it will age, it will rot, and we will need to reinvent it. Uh, uh, so, I don't know where to answer your question, but that's the, that, I think that's the nature of the thing that's in, inescapable. Thank you, that's an excellent question to begin with. So, I have other comments or questions? It hasn't got to be such a complicated question. Be a really simple question. <laughs> yes, okay, Hi, my name is Brooke, and I know James through the Hong Kong Writer Circle. I'm always curious. Um, I, you, you came to the book with a concept of what you wanted to do, but I'm always curious uh, if writers have their characters in mind, or if they just start writing and the characters arrive. I have the, uh, con uh, the overall concept of setting, uh, what I want to say, and I actually, I have uh, um, this kind of story, especially my, the kind I, I kind of like, uh, has no plots, I don't have plots. I wake up and discover, when I was working on it, eight months, it was basically full time, it was very interesting. I wake up early in the morning 
And then I have ideas. Yes, that's what he's going to do today. It's not like I was discovering. I was only a reporter. I was discovering what the characters are going through every day. And I just jot it down sometimes. So even 5 o'clock in the morning, I'll be making secret messages. And my wife is getting very suspicious. <laughs> uh, I have to thank my wife. You see the slides. The PowerPoint is beautiful. You know, because Satu, it's a PowerPoint, PowerPoint genius. But anyway. I got that um, on tape. <laughs> and that's not even a lie. Uh, but when it comes to the characters, I did plan it very uh, in great detail. Of course, it's not in the book. Uh, what I when I started out uh, planning, okay, there's this number of people stuck in that situation. I would write a CV for each of them. I actually would say, for for example, Song Song, how tall he is? He's six feet tall. He's 42 years old now. He's got curly hair, and uh, his physique, uh, his education, and his father, as he went, did he go to uh, where to study, what did he study, he studied engineering by the way, and uh, what, are, what are his marks like, these are all irrelevant, you won't see it in the book also, but uh, if I do not build up the character to that kind of detail, like a good friend of mine I know very well and I can close my eyes and see him, it would be very difficult to imagine what he wants to do next you know, in the book. So, I, I think that in terms of the, uh, the, the characters, uh, I, I actually spend a lot of time. I can send you the CVs of some <laughs> <laughs> No one's ever read that, except me. <laughs> I think that's really important. Um, particularly if you're going to write a series with the same characters, if you haven't made a note of how tall they are, what, co what kind of hair they have, incredible inconsistencies can arise. So, so I think that this is a very professional attitude. Um, the fact that these points are not stated in the book is, is actually irrelevant, mm -hmm. but, but that you know them, and so everything is consistent with itself. Other questions? Yes. It comes in. I mean, engineer, yes, yes. <laughs> a golf friend with uh, James. I know James first time in the golf course. Yeah. Um, you don't read, right? Yeah. I don't read, I don't even read your book, yeah. <laughs> um, I think you said the end of the world is 2090. To me, I think it's a bit too soon. <laughs> and you are, you are, you are the four reasons causes of this end. Uh, just this forecast, I don't think is uh, is convincing. Uh, look at your graph, I missed the point. You say the the demographic will be dropped, you know, uh, significantly, um, unless there is some sort of disease that which we cannot cure, mainly disease or whatever, which is just like the SARS or Zika, whatever, or Ebola, you know, which we cannot cure, then the it will be spread to very slow. Yeah, but the, the graph you saw is dropped very yeah. uh, oh, significantly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but unless you know, there's some sort of things, because human beings exist for well, several million years, yeah, yeah. and the, 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 the cultures, we have civilizations 10,000 years, and it takes, what, 80 years from now to <coughs> get to the end. A bit too soon, you know. <laughs> so you have to give more reason. <laughs> 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 Why do you care? You'll be dead anyway. Uh, number one, yeah, I want to look at the average age again. The average age actually is quite high, which is reflects our current very highly developed uh, societies. It's uh, around 80. Uh, and then it dropped. Now you look at that, you, what you've missed is that, uh, num number one, the, the important drop is when there is no more electricity. The, when they, when they, when they, they just cannot afford, there's no more mining, there's no more mining of uh, natural gas and coal and so on, so you cannot generate power anymore. Once you cannot generate power anymore, uh, you, uh, you cannot sustain our current medical system. And once that fails, our life expectancy would drop very dramatically down from 80 something to back down to like maybe 50, 60, whatever, you know. So that, that's the one of the reasons. And the other reason, other big drops, 
are due to epidemics. You know, like I, I, I have a chapter on epidemics, you know, make it look like the bacteria are actually enemies. They do plot how to kill strategically, you know, how to kill off as many people as possible and, and so on. Um, 2090 may be a bit too soon, and, uh, but, but you, th you, ass you are assuming it is the end. Ah, thank you very much for asking that question. Because I did could put a question mark and I've forgotten to mention. Is it the end? I know, I, 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 you were assuming it's the end. Uh, I was assuming it's the end too. When I was writing the book, that's how, uh, I don't care. And I have, I, I think it's against my amoral principle to contrive a happy ending. So I, I didn't have anything in mind, seriously. I open-mindedly reaching the end of the book, but then the real end of the book surprised me. Huh, it surprised me so much, I almost cried. <laughs> you won't believe it, because I, I, was, I was going through a lot of stress at the time. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it surprised me, and I hope it would surprise you too, and, and you know, and the discovery enjoyable when you, when you find out. Now I will ask you next time what the end is, you, know, you have to at least read the last few pages. <laughs> yeah. Can I just add a point? As an electrical power engineer, I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> you are, you are reasoning, you know, there will be a lot of electricity. If water will still run, we still have hydro, we still have green, solar, you know. So, power failure or power existence of electricity power is not one of the main reasons for, for this problem. It will come from some other things, bacteria, or some sort of you know, disease that you know, killer, you know. But not you just about Otherwise, you know, you are an engineer as well, and I'm an engineer, you know, so... I'm not, I'm a writer. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are useless, you know. Used to. Bicycles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't think, I don't think so, but, I, you know, it's not, not in the beginning. That's why when you see that graph, it lasts a long time. Everything will continue. But at some point, when the average age is uh, already reaching the 70s, you cannot maintain uh, uh, power plants like this. And in fact, if, if you do read the book, you'll find out that it, that's a, not a spoiler because that's a, a principle, you know, how the power plant got, got closed down because at some point we start to plan, you know, because these are hazardous facilities. You don't want the power plant, number one, Hong Kong has no hydroelectricity. And you don't want the power plant to close themselves. So if you know, the, what, the, the, the remnant population at some point would decide, you know, we can't go on anymore. Look, at, look around this room. Everyone, the youngest guy, youngest man around is in his 70s. You know? And then you said, if we don't close it down, you know, there are, there are still a handful of younger people. It will be a disaster for them. So especially nuclear power plant that has to be closed down, decommissioned. And in fact, in the decommission, decommissioning process, uh, the VIP gives speeches, and VIPs always pretend nothing is going to happen. This is temporary. You would make a good one. Is that, this is only temporary. Don't worry, we will reopen. And I look forward to the reopening party with you. And then, uh, a stu and then they three to one, they switch the power off, and a few very stupid people even clap. You, know. you, have, you have to write another story. Yeah. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> well, not so much specialized expertise, but um, I do have a couple of uh, questions. For Jane. The first one is that uh, when when you were describing the creative process of uh, waking up every morning and then sort of going through life with your characters and then jotting down the notes and all that, uh, like a reporter, um, I, I'm curious: did your characters um, think in uh, Chinese? <laughs> and or both, um, and did they do so? The same characters do so consistently from day to day, or like, for example, I mean, if a certain character does not know Chinese and only knew English on a certain day, would he the next day suddenly know Chinese as well? <laughs> and were they consistent in that sense? Uh, and second, my second question is: uh, Was there any reason uh, why you chose? Uh, Eurasian as your main character. 
I'll answer the second one first because I, I love Eurasians. <laughs> I guess my daughter is Eurasian. <laughs> so I'm biased. And uh, I think they're wonderful people when they listen. Uh, and by the Get way, Tom, Tom, Tom's Eurasian too. <laughs> Uh, what's the first one? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, look, the English, that's, a, that's a very interesting question, Tom, and I didn't even ask you to ask that. Uh, is I, because I, well, my writing process, I, when I write, although with Man's Last Song I wrote a lot in English, really, 70-80% English before I start my, uh, my Chinese version. And they are not translation of, it, uh, translation of each other. Uh, they're just parallel development. And I discovered one thing, which I think a lot of academics have pointed it out, but I, I never experienced the, the impact, which is quite dramatic, is that uh, I've written something in English, and then I write the same thing in Chinese. I discovered that, not always, but maybe a good 20-30% of the book, I think differently when I, I'm writing the Chinese version, because I, I see things differently, it's a different perspective, uh, the, the value systems would be different, the solution would be different, the reaction would be different. And, uh, and, and therefore, some of them can be re-exported back to the English version. Some of them I just left it. And, and if uh, eventually you have the English and Chinese version, uh, you will find out that parts of it are completely different. You know, completely different because they cannot be translated like the sutras. You know, and so I just, I just left it, left it at that. But uh, uh, when I wrote it, most of the time, because I, I started out uh, the English as the foundation, most of the time, uh, yes, I, at that time I would be all thinking in, thinking in English, because otherwise, it, 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 you know, it would be, yeah, it would be a waste of time, wouldn't it? Yeah. I thought it would be the circle of life. How it, mostly everyone thinks that Asians roam the world first, they would be the last to end the world, <laughs> and that would be the circle of life. That, that's a, well, that's a good point. I didn't think of it that way, but it, it could be. Yeah, yeah. Although, or well, maybe eventually walk back to Africa and die. <laughs> yeah. 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 is very uh, spiritually cynical. I think that kind of, you know, I, 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 I find it easier to think, he, what, think how he think when I'm writing about him. So it must be, it must reflect something about me. And the, uh, I think the second aspect may be, I'm also the youngest man around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did I learn about, I, 
I think I think I, what I learned about myself is what I learned about uh, a lot of people too. In fact, uh, it's changing all the time. As I work through the novel, my even my view of the story and my uh, my interpretation of the characters have changed quite dramatically throughout that eight months when when the, when the framework was uh, being written. Uh, so I, I think that that is that is the most important thing. And, and I, I like to keep that lesson because to to define ourselves one way or the other uh, doesn't last. Yeah. Avoiding a question. What is it? Avoiding a question. So what is the lesson then? The lesson. That you, you personally learned. I personally, I, yeah. Yourself. Yeah, I think I think that is. I, I'm changing all the time. I, I do think that I'm changing all the time, and there's uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and also, may, maybe if it, re I don't think there's any uh, lesson per se that I learn for myself, and from there on, I can rely on that lesson and become a better person. In that sense, I, I didn't learn anything. But I learned about some of the maybe perhaps the hidden perspectives in in, in me, you know. And I do think that uh, uh, I do think that wom uh, women uh, and men, the difference between women and men. And in here, uh, you would find out I, I do portray women to be, in drastic situations, much stronger. In this kind of situation, women are much stronger. Just don't, don't no bullshit. We just want to survive, that kind of thing. Where, whereas men, after so many decades of uh, spoiling, we tend to be more intellectual and talk about it and so on. But we've lost that, on the other hand, we've lost that caveman instinct, uh, which our ancestors have. We're not tough anymore. We are very intellectual, but you know, going round and round in circle, getting nowhere. Whereas the women do the dishes. <laughs> well, I didn't learn anything about myself. I learned something about women. <laughs> Thank you. Any any other questions or observations? Hello. Um, I'm probably the youngest. <laughs> um, so my question comes uh, with my age. So um, I'm a PhD student, so I have to write uh, on a weekly basis. Um, so my question is, how do we encourage young people to write more? Like nowadays, we read a lot. We read through our phones, computers, internet, whatever. But um, I do not have friends who write on a regular basis. So how do you encourage young people to write more, especially write professionally? Mm. Uh, excellent question. I, I don't know whether I have the answer. But that's a very good, very good question. And it reflects a lot of what, we, what we're doing. I think, number one, to encourage, him, encourage them to write, they have to start reading. Uh, and uh, to read books, I'm quite disappointed that, uh, that you know, so few people read books anymore. Um, uh, Men's last song was selling, selling very well in a, in a few demos. It was even bestseller in the one in Lindhurst Terrace. Uh, but they've all subsequently closed. It's got nothing to do with me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the coincidence is spooky and it's very heartbreaking. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, like, like, as I pointed out, there's endless distraction. I, I really think to be uh, realistic and not to, you know, uh, to be realistic. Only a very small minority will uh, will be talked into having a better reading habit, and once they have a better reading habit, they, the things they get from the book will encourage them to write and to write uh, and to write better. Uh, but I'm afraid it will be the minority. I do think that not having like both my daughters have very good reading habits, uh, but we don't have a TV at home. I wasn't joking. I haven't had one since 1982. Uh, so my older girl, 25 now, uh, and grew up with our TV. She even thanked me a few years ago. She said, that's wonderful. You know, I said, thanks, Bob. I said, what, you know. So not for us growing up with our TV, I've now noticed what a privilege it is. And uh, this is a true story, but she could be lying. You know, <laughs> but, uh, but they have very good reading habits. And therefore, because they have the reading habit, they write relatively well. Uh, I think that's why quite important. Buy books, right, Julian? <laughs> 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 yes, Brian first and then Brian. Yes, Brian. Um, I'm interested in the question about um, 
wanted to ask a question which is not handled in the book, and I'm not saying that it should be handled, but uh, of lately there have been a lot of, um, like there are people who are consciously making changes. There are people who are eating well, uh, wanting to buy food which is grown in a different way. So <coughs> there is a small portion in the world who are aware and consciously making changes in various ways. Um, so do you think that, like h how is it going to contribute, that, that portion, how is it going to grow and contribute towards the future that we are going to have? And why did you not uh, address that in the book? Actually, I, I have addressed that indirectly. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I answer your question, uh, these are all very good things, provided, provided that it's done with minimal, minimal research and rational decision. Because if you, we, a lot of time we do it because it's fashionable, because it's uh, in WhatsApp people say, oh no, start, uh, uh, start eating cholesterol tomorrow, you know, because it's good for you, and no, no, no more cholesterol the day after. You know, if, if you're doing that kind of thing, uh, it, it's pointless. Uh, and but there, there's a lot of that going on. But it's still not come not bad because if the intention is there, that's step number one. I would encourage it rather than just deride it and ridicule them. You know, we're not. It, it, I, I'm not that cynical. I would encourage them. But I think that it would be good if you want to make a lifestyle change. Invest that little bit of time, not much, a little bit of time to find out uh, uh, what it means. You know. And in you know, lifestyle changes, you know, for instance, uh, uh, Teresa taking a nap. I, I I'm not you know, taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just meditating. <laughs> 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 no, for, the answer. for example, she's an investor. It's what about investing? You know, investing. Uh, it, it, there's nothing wrong with it. But in fact, related to the book is, if I can give, uh, may give an uh, analogy, in our whole life, all we can eat is, say, 10 tons of rice. And don't Google it, it's just an arbitrary number. If all our life we can eat 10 tons of life, and now I have accumulated, for example, I might have accumulated 15 tons, that's why I retired. But a lot of people have accumulated 200 tons, 6,000 tons, even 200,000 tons of rice. And you might say, that's absurd. You know, all you can, all you can eat, you, you eat full time. That's only, you can only eat uh, 10 tons of rice. Why do you need 200,000 tons? And not only that, not only that, not only they say, well, now I've got 200,000 tons, I might as well spend my time, you know, meditating, doing yoga, reading, buy some books, read, buy some books. learn to write, and so on, even learn calligraphy, even write longhand. And there are many things you can do to make your life more interesting. But instead, you know what they do? They invest that surplus, surplus rice in investment, and try to get more rice, which they don't need. <laughs> and and what? And, yeah. And worse, worse. When and they even set targets. They said, oh, this extra 199,000 tons of rice should generate a return of minimum five percent. But last year, it's only four and a half percent. So he's disappointed. He's pissed off. He's stressed, and get bad breath as well because his investment is not delivering. It's not on target. I have to talk to my investor. Maybe I'll fire her tomorrow. That kind of thing. You think about it, it's, it's, it's actually a mental disease, but everyone is doing it. It's everyone is doing it. And, uh, and you think, so change of life, change of lifestyle for the good takes a bit of thinking. And, and it doesn't have to be philosophical or very technical. But if we first think about it, plan it, and do it consistently, it, I think it's always a good thing. And you will learn from it and be willing to change. Once you start it, maybe you know, after two years, you find, okay, you make adjustments. And, and I think if everyone can do this, and we start with not wasting, we keep the same lifestyle, but stop wasting, it would be a very, it, it would be a worthwhile thing to do. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, please. Hi, James. Um, in the course of your writing, have you got any idea about uh, since you are talking about mental uh, trouble, you know, getting more and more in this world, uh, do you perceive any chance of uh, uh, the end of the world 
by a, a certain kind of uh, third world war, termination of the, uh, the earth by war instead of the environmental distress you mentioned in your book. Yeah, I, I, it's, a, it's a question that I, I have to really, you know, make wild guesses. Um, like I, I like the leader of uh, North Korea, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, you know, like even in North Korea, I, I, I've recently read an article by an American uh, diplomat who's worked there, worked with the North Korean for 20, 30 years. And it changed, made me think, you know, he just said they are not, they are just putting on a show, they are not nearly as irrational as it appears because they know these are the chips and as a, as a nation in that particular situation and so on which made a lot of sense because he's dealt with them for years and years and years, they are very rational, they are very calculating, very stubborn uh, and so on, which I, I believe. Um, I, I think that the, the chance of a very devastating third world war is there but uh, it would be by mistake. I think it would be my, by miscalculation, by mistake, rather than intentional. Because although I have so little confidence in contemporary politicians, I don't think in the foreseeable future they're crazy enough to uh, you know, actually trigger something that would be mutual, mutual annihilation. I don't see that happening. But there are other, other things can increase the tension, uh, resources and so on, and, and, and food. It increased the tension to a point that for, don't forget we are animals. You know, ultimately, uh, now in the, in this kind of social condition, uh, for example, it would be uh, wrong, and I, I do agree it's wrong to steal or to rob. But imagine that we all need food to eat. We that, that's what we're doing. We're living like animals. Uh, there's no concept for uh, uh, theft or robbery because I see a piece of bread, you're taking it, I won't go over. If I can afford it, I kick you in the head, I grab the piece of bread and, and run. That's just a normal human behavior. Uh, I don't think we would get to that point also. But there, but there will be, uh, it, from the optimistic side, I do think that it will get so bad to a point that uh, there will be an awakening. You know, but before then, there, there will be pain. There will be pain. But there, I think that we are still human beings are still capable of thinking again, still capable of leadership, problem solving, and get out, get us out of what we are today. Because right now it's very comfortable, but it won't last very long. And 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 I think that awakening will happen. But before then, it will be quite painful. Yeah. Thank, you very, thank you very much. So a very interesting final question. I'm afraid an interesting answer. Thank you very much to the audience, it's been wonderful, lovely questions, very interesting questions, and James for batting them back, batting them back so well. And thank you very much indeed to the University of Hong Kong Library's Reading Club, all the staff, the organisation, their support is very much appreciated. Thank you James, thank you Gillian for uh, being our moderator and our speaker, and uh, on behalf of the library I'd like to present you with a gift. Thank you, thank you. And uh, going back to the, if I could throw in some questions, going back to two questions, uh, 2090 and the last question, come after November, the risk might be even higher, and your 2090 <laughs> might be sooner, and I hope you let me into Canada. <laughs> and uh, so... Um, Trouble becomes the president. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That may be the pain before the wickedness. Uh, Scary. It's going completely backwards. Um, our upcoming book talk will be on Saturday, 7th of May, and our speaker will be uh, the Honorable Dr. Vivian Poy, former Senator of Canada. Notice the trend? Canadian? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that will be an interesting talk on her new book, uh, Heroes and Gamblers, uh, the tale of survival and good fortune of the Poy family. So that will be on Saturday, the 7th of May, uh, here in the Special Collections from 4 to 7 p.m. 4, no, so 4 to 6 p.m. 4 to 6 p.m. If you are not on our mailing list, uh, feel free to stop by and see me before you leave to give me your email and we'll, we'll be more than happy to add you to our list. Um, 
Another thing is coming up. Uh, you may have seen some of the construction work down on the second floor. It'll be our new uh, second floor entrance for the library, the main library, which we also are going to have a brand new uh, exhibition area. The exhibition area will probably be about the size of this open area. Mm -hmm. And we'll be having some initial, well, we're waiting for the contractors and the building departments to give us the go ahead, but we're hoping to have some very exciting exhibitions soon after. All right, so thank you for coming and enjoy your evening.